Welcome to On the Park Bench, a public square conversation brought to you by the Congress for the New Urbanism. On the Park Bench uh, presents interactive conversations with thought leaders in the new urbanism and allied industries, giving the audience an opportunity to engage in real time. The webinar series is a platform to engage, debate, and collaborate on pressing issues of the day dealing with urbanism. Today we have uh, an author's forum, uh, part of our author's forum series, uh, a new book, uh, Urbanism for a Difficult Future, uh, with author Corkut Anarin and interviewer Fernando Pages Ruiz. So share your thoughts on hashtag on the park bench. And register for coming webinars, uh, Tuesday, November 15th. That's a week from today. Same time, join Brian Falk of the Project for Lean Urbanism and architect and urban designer, Kevin Klinkenberg, to discuss a recent toolkit designed to overcome the burdens faced by small builders and investors in walkable neighborhoods. Uh, Tuesday, December 6th. Uh, um, same time, Dr. Jamie uh, Creekwe of the Physical Activity Policy Research and Evaluation Network is going to discuss research into the growth of form-based and similar land, land use regulations nationwide. And Tuesday, December 13th, uh, join author William Fulton and CNU co-founder Elizabeth Mool as they discuss place and prosperity, how cities help us to connect and innovate. Go to cnu.org slash resources slash on the park bench to find out more and register. Uh, our author, Korkut Anarin, uh, is a founder and principal of Pell Ona Architects and Urbanists. He also teaches as adjunct in the College of Architecture and Planning, University of Colorado at Denver. Urbanism, resilience, and development codes have been a focus of his teaching and practice. His book, Crafting Form-Based Codes, Resilient Design, Policy, and Regulation was published by Rutledge in 2019. He also co-authored a book with our interviewer today, and that is Fernando Pages Ruiz, a developer of 30 years in affordable housing and ethnic design. He is an author, including Architectural Design for Traditional Neighborhoods with Corcut, our guest today. And Fernando's developments have been recognized by the National Association of Home Builders, including Green Building, Single Family House of the Year, and Workforce Housing Award. Recently, he's been working with Andreas Duani on designing neighborhoods for Hispanic Im immigrants. I'm Rob Studeville, editor of CNU's Public Square. Urbanism for a Difficult Future, Practical Responses to the Climate Crisis is a guide to launching the next generation of land use planning and urbanism that will enable us to adapt and survive the consequences of climate change. This book makes the case that it's too late to mitigate the worst impacts of climate change and that we need to get serious about community adaptation. He describes what community adaptation looks like and how public policy can support it. First, Corkut will present, followed by a discussion with Fernando, and then Q&A from the audience. Please use the Q&A function of Zoom to ask your questions as they occur to you. And now I'm going to pass this along to Corkut. Thank you, Rob. Okay. Let me share my screen. Do you guys see the full screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, first off, this book, even though it has my name, it reflects uh, contributions by a lot of people, especially uh, Andres uh, Duany and uh, Paul Crabtree. Uh, it started with a workshop we did in our office in Boulder, three days workshop. The, uh, some of the basic ideas uh, showed up there. And then in different uh, <clears throat> uh, venues we presented and there are you know adaptation related discussions going on in several email groups uh, you know i learned from those conversations a lot as well so i like to acknowledge that so with me you know these are some pictures from our workshop and then we did a presentation in the school and that was the uh, initial 
version of the what we call it adaptation village and then this framework uh, on which the book depends on uh, what came out of after that uh, workshop uh, what you're seeing here is what we call action uh, framework that is there's the overarching uh, objective of localization of the sustenance systems and then enabling relocating people and in terms of the sustenance systems energy water food waste goods essential goods production of essential goods those are the sustenance systems and we need a social organization and governmental system localized governmental system that can enable and manage the uh, localized sustenance systems and then there are certain design principles that follow. I'm just going to go very quickly uh, oops, the model. And again, even though this looks like a designed, uh, you know, detailed uh, village plan, we looked at this as a model. That is, there are certain principles here that can be applied in different contexts. Uh, <clears throat> what you're seeing here, you know, there are the neighborhoods, there's the center, and then there are the support districts. And the whole site plan is organized by items that nest within each other. You know, there's a compound uh, formed by several buildings, and then several compounds come together, create a block with a green in the middle, and then several uh, blocks come together with a green in the middle, a quadrant, and then four quadrants are located around the village center and there are some energy and recycling and food farming support areas. This is a block you're seeing formed by uh, <clears throat> several compounds. I'm not going to go into details, you know, the book explained these in very, but I'm just giving you an idea of what this model is. Uh, you're seeing some views from uh, towards the center uh, green of a block. There's a water tower, a you know meeting area, uh, <clears throat> community gardens, and then the, the the village center accommodates a wide variety of opportunities for businesses. And we looked at the uh, building types, you know, some flex spaces. By the way, what we're saying is that there should be mixed use. We call it hybrid, uh, meaning that uses that support each other in all true, especially in the uh, <clears throat> central area. That is to say, even if we're talking about a flex space, a manufacturing place, maybe there's a studio in the uh, building as well for residential. So mixing those supporting uses are, are very key. Uh, some views, I'm just, again, uh, go very fast. <laughs> And then also the support districts provide, uh, depending on the context and technology, uh, food production and uh, energy production. And sometimes these can be combined. But the way we approach these, these are actually civil areas as well. It's not just, you know, uh, chained and isolated production areas. It's uh, amenities for, you know, community members to learn from. And then there's a circulation system. Most of the uh, except for the central area, most of the streets are shared streets. Uh, they are the, what we call mews. There's the primary mews and secondary mews. Again, I don't need to go into the details, but what we're saying is that even the, you know, this is a primary mews. It's more like a plaza, continuous plaza, but even the mews uh, that are secondary and they're function more like an alley actually at the same time accommodates a social uh, realm and a lot of businesses as well. Uh, so this is the, I mean, uh, very quickly what the model is. But what we're saying is that it's this particular uh, <clears throat> framework, the action framework that is important and that can be applied in a lot of locations. It can be urban infill, it can be suburban retrofit, it can be peripheral metropolitan, which is what we work on this particular model, but it's like just an example and it can be rural. And that's really crucial. That is to say, it's not what we're showing in terms of physical environment, it's the principles. You know, these principles should be able to apply to different locations. Now, uh, <clears throat> You know, there's a lot of discussion about receiving cities, receiving regions and such. Uh, what we're saying is that 
you know, it's not the cities, it's not the regions. You don't need to, the climate migration is not gonna only happen thousands of miles away. In within every given region, there are safer places and more risky places. Every given maybe 10 miles and 10 miles, or let's say, depending, there are always uh, exceptions, but there is a, a relatively safer place and relatively not safe place. And we need to enable moving in much more minor uh, uh, scale. So how this can happen, you know, there is the standard zone. We learn from the past. And one interesting uh, event happened is the starting of the zoning. It was a federal act enabled and showed the way for localization of the uh, planning system. It ended up separating the users and such and um, created very vulnerable landscapes, unfortunately. But the lesson is still there. That is to say, a federal initiative or state initiative may really enable a very different planning culture in the local. So that's why we're saying that, an adaptation enabling act. I mean, a lot of these things can be done by local governments and cities and counties right now. But if we want to see a more comprehensive and fast move, it would really have to have a federal initiation. So what is this initiation? This initiation should encourage new comprehensive plans to include receiving zones. And receiving zone is a zoning category to which we apply certain policies and rules. We need to look at the receiving zone as a tool, as a planning tool. And yes, it needs to be relatively a safer place. And I'm gonna go through very quickly four different, uh, four uh, policies we suggest to apply to the receiving zones. First is the productive ownership opportunities. For centuries, the property produced something. Only this century, last 50 years, 60 years, we created something called residential property that sucks money and not, it creates nothing. It creates only financial burden. So this is a study, you know, Erie Town Center. I worked with EPZ for a, a charrette. And in that charrette, one of the ideas is that instead of a big bank mansion, can we split that into two, three, or even four small units and still have the uh, same amount of building and probably same amount of people. I'll come back to that. And then in my own practice, we we did some uh, zoning course. This is a uh, golden Colorado, and this is adapted actually, uh, where we used, you know, the regular lots can have more than one building. And as long as the total of those are comparable, I mean, the total of the building full, uh, floor area co comparable with regular large houses, these were okay. Uh, and then, you know, we also went further and then said, you know, maybe you can even subdivide these. And then another code, is Springville, Utah, uh, which was adapted, which is adapted as well, uses the same idea of clusters by mixing some spaces more appropriate for businesses with the uh, uh, more appropriate for residential. And then that comes back to our uh, compound. Uh, <clears throat> The important thing here is that, you know, in terms of density, everybody talks about density and, you know, uh, when you propose something like this, uh, oh, you're increasing the number of buildings. And the way a lot of zoning organizations look at the residential density, interestingly enough, is the units per acre. Everything else are, uh, the density is measured by the amount of building. When you come to residential, for some reason, we said on units per acre, except for building, uh, building code actually, the building code still treats the residential occupancy in terms of the amount of building. Bigger the unit, more people live there is the assumption of uh, building code. We know, I mean, we know that that's not the case usually. It's, you know, there are a lot of small families, young families occupying large houses. However, something we're seeing in the front range especially is that since the supply of housing is mostly mansions and there's a lot of demand for smaller units, 
we see doubling up. A lot of people live with parents or other friends. You know, that's one, you know, living with parents is one way because, you know, the young couple cannot afford a Mac mansion nowadays and they double up. Or they come together with other friends and buy a house and share, or they buy a big house and then rent and uh, if the zoning allows in that particular jurisdiction. <clears throat> but what we're seeing is, is interesting, that is that building code's assumption of larger the unit, more people in it, is becoming a truth. So that's something I say to the communities, you know, the way you measure residential density is wrong. You know, it's like you have a 3000 square feet building and a lot, and then I'm saying, you're gonna divide that into three, thousand square feet uh, buildings and the same amount of people, same amount of building uh, floor area. Uh, why are we thinking that we're tripling the density? Because that's a horrible thing measure. Anyway, uh, long story short, <clears throat> what we're also thinking in these compounds, these are, you know, uh, not only residential, but it can be, uh, you know, what we call it. And that's also in the appendix of the build, uh, book, the use categories we created are defined there. There's a cottage uh, production, uh, cottage retail, and cottage farming. So <coughs> the, these are the, the fed, fed, uh, preferential, I'm looking at the time, uh, tax treatment is a very important, you know, the, we're familiar with this policy, opportunity zones. That should be another uh, policy that should be applied to the receiving zones. Tax deduction for rent, very important, is another policy that would change the way we look at the housing. And what we're saying is that tax deduction for rent should be uh, A, the primary breadwinner should live in certain proximity. The second, the owner of the unit should occupy the same lot. Meaning that we're really looking at a not large, you know, uh, apartment complexes, but really a well-mixed community that can support the local economy that we're advocating. And then finally, you know, let's direct some of the hazard mitigation and hard uh, money into really supporting localization of the uh, of the sustenance systems, you know, the water, electricity, power, uh, food, any kind of, especially in terms of the recycling, sewage, power, and water. You know, a lot of communities may need financial support to be able to localize and be self-sufficient. And again, when you look at these principles and policies, you realize that the application spectrum is pretty large. We need to be able to really go to the urban infill as well as the suburban retrofit and apply some of these principles. The shape of the plan and the model, you know, it's gonna be different than what we showed as a model, but that's just a model that can be applied. The important thing is this particular uh, framework. So that's it. Now we can have, I'm gonna stop sharing. We can have questions and answers. Well, very good. Good morning, uh, Corkett, or I guess good afternoon. And so good morning to you. Good afternoon to the yeah. <laughs> to many, many in the audience, but it's a pleasure to see you. It's a wonderful book. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a mercifully short book too. So it's quite readable. I read it on a couple of plane rides and, and more than the importance of the topic itself, uh, the writing and the way that you evolve uh, the book and the arguments you make, they're, they're very pleasing to read, uh, understandable, even for someone who's not a planner. And I think it uh, hopefully will be a very influential book. Now, Thank the you. background that you seem to, um, you know, the background of this book is that it's inevitable, the impacts of climate change. And uh, so by coincidence, we're speaking on election day and also the second day of COP27, the uh, <clears throat> large uh, UN climate change meeting happening in uh, Sharm el-Sheikh, the uh, trendy and, and beautiful Egyptian uh, resort. 
Um, they're speaking there today, and when Egyptian officials announced their priorities for COP27, they emphasized two things, which you emphasize, finance and adaptation. And they wanted this as a new approach, given that previous COPs mainly focused on mitigation, reducing emissions to limit climate change. You make a very similar distinction in your book. What is the difference between climate mitigation and adaptation? Thank you. That has been a big discussion for <laughs> years uh, in the forum. Uh, I think the way we approach is that mitigation assumes the life continues as it is. And some kind of big technology miracle is going to reverse the global warming and we'll be okay. Now, there are a lot of vulnerabilities. I'm just, you know, we'll start with, let's say Mr. Smith lives in suburbia, commutes an hour to work. Water and energy comes from regional systems. Food comes from supermarket. Uh, waste is sold by, uh, again, regional, uh, maybe metropolitan uh, system. And, Mail order is essential goods. Uh, Mr. Smith doesn't have a lot of time because com commute and such, so he doesn't know his neighbors much, except for a few that he fights with, uh, and probably spends most of the weekends in different functions for the kids and such. So in that lifestyle, there are a lot of vulnerabilities. If the system goes down, probably in the near future, Mr. Smith is going to be a climate refugee. Lost a lot of property, who knows? Now, as a planner and urbanist, I look at that and I feel like it is my responsibility to produce policies to change that, to give opportunities for those lifestyles to be somewhere else. And because at the end of the day, the planning profession created that environment for them. You know, we never had suburbia 100 years ago like this. You know, we never depended on the external sources this much. We've never been this vulnerable in another way. So immediately my mind goes, okay, how can we introduce local sewage systems? Because, you know, like the, I explained that in the book, you know, there are a lot of, amazing amount of failures of large sewage systems and water pollution. I mean, we should just start today to disconnect ourselves from large systems and create smaller uh, treatment facilities and technologies there. There are a lot of options. Same thing about the water. If the water goes down our pollution, you know, we don't have any other water sources. We don't have systems. I mean, some areas have systems, but, you know, in the past, blocks, neighborhoods, they have their own systems. So we lost that kind of self-sufficiency. So it, we need to start reintroducing. And that's the whole story of adaptation. That is to say, what are the policies and tools that we can retrofit suburbia and give more resilience to that very vulnerable lifestyle? I mean, that's just a, and again, you know, <clears throat> then actually that brings us another, another another layer maybe mr smith's location is very risky location it's going to be flood or storm again so we need to provide an opportunity for mr smith to move not thousand miles away but maybe 10 miles away five miles away to a safer space or maybe mr smith's location is okay and we can maybe it qualifies to be within a receiving zone. Then we create that zone and really apply those policies and make that life much more resilient. That's the whole story. Now, Mr. Smith, uh, like me, enjoys a little bit of city life. And I was wondering, you know, you I, I know that it's just an example, you mm -hmm. know, but the example, it seems very bucolic, very rural. You've got 5,000 people in a 15-minute walking shed. You know, the Amish 
live in communities of 50 to 75,000. They're much, much larger. They're self-sufficient communities. Was this enough variety of people to supply all the different um, skill sets that are needed in a community? And I know we talked about this once and, and um, <clears throat> you gave me some ideas that I thought were, were uh, that, that are not in your book, but I thought were really uh, made the argument very well of how you could live within this self-submission community, even if it's kind of a frontier community, the one you drew in your book, that's just a small community with, you know, the quadrants at the, at the ends with, with agriculture and, and uh, solar farming, et cetera. In that small of a community of that 5,000, 15-minute walking shed, even if it's not close to a larger city area or it's been for some reason irreparably uh, you know, separated from it, how can you achieve enough diversity to have like a life beyond just simply a struggle for self-sufficiency and survival? You, you, you put enjoyment as one of the characteristics important in uh, the planning for these communities. How would Mr. Smith enjoy his life in this little adaptation village. Yeah, I mean, I think the fact that our model was kind of like a village, self-contained village, gives the uh, idea that it is isolated. It, you know, especially if you go into the urban infill and certain suburban retrofits lo locations, that's not the case. The connection, I mean, that walking 15 minute shed needs to nest in larger sheds. The whole idea, however, is that in case of disruptions within that 15 minute shed, you can survive. How is the question? How can we enable that life to survive within that shed? Because that's, you know, it's aggressive, like, you know, I agree, it's very kind of like, whoa, you know, we're so dependent to regional systems that how can we create that kind of self-sufficiency in a walking ship? But when you look at the history, it's there, it has been done. I mean, even the urban environments, when you look at, you know, late 1800s had similar sh nesting sheds, that is to say one block can close themselves and live for a while with whatever they have. I mean, <clears throat> Interestingly enough, there are some communities in Colorado, we're working with, you know, the for zoning, you know, up to 50s, there's this Louisville, uh, Colorado, their center of the town had a lot of <coughs> the Italian workers and such. It was almost zero waste. It created its own food. And yeah, I mean, that's the kind of thing we need to aspire it doesn't mean that it needs to be isolated from the region isolated mm -hmm. from town, isolated from surrounding i mean life is going to continue it's just that when the sewer system fails your life becomes miserable if you depend on it if mm -hmm. you have your own system in the you know even in the block or you know then it's a different story that's the kind of resilience we need to create right now to be able to uh, handle the disruptions when they come, but not necessarily separate. Not it's not off grid by necessity. It's not it's not isolationist. It's just be able to handle the disruptions when and if they come. Exactly. One other thing we did in this that suburbia created. You know, we created an environment only residential, and people live. I mean, sleep there part of their day. I always look at that, you know, let's say a neighborhood of thousand people. Within that thousand people, there's a lot of expertise and profession. Imagine you use only four hours of their services within the neighborhood a week. That is to say, they have a back room, they have something spatially organized where they can produce, you know, if they're doctors, they're doctor and doctor, if they're plumbers, they do the plumbing in the community. That's the kind of lean economy you can create. Lean because it's not tight, it's not really, <clears throat> not necessarily efficient like other economies, but still there's a local economy that supports life to a degree. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, in our conversation, you talked about the idea of two day a two day a week restaurants that various people would have, and I found that very appealing. I would like to have a two day, <laughs> and I'd like to come to your house every once in a while for dinner too. Um, now, in this book, uh, you don't always only get into the physical aspects. You know what what um, what infrastructure and what uh, buildings and such are needed, but you talk a lot about management in terms of social organization. Um, you know, economic social organization and management of this self-sufficiency, you kind of went over a little bit when you were talking about uh, earlier, when you were talking about the compounds, but there's two concepts that you have in this book that I found interesting and, and were actually new to me, uh, the concepts of succession, succession and subsidiarity and how that works within the context of this community. <coughs> Well, yeah, uh, you know, subsidiarity is, let me back up. You know, I'm in, I've been doing the study abroad, taking students to Turkey villages and especially touristic areas and look at the way life is changing. The more tourism industry comes into the shore, the more people start to be isolated and they lose their autonomy. They lose the control over their daily lives. That kind of kept me looking at that concept, subsidiarity. And then when Andres was talking about it, it just hit me. That's very important. That is to say, yes, we have strong local, local economies. Yes, we can express uh, our opinions and positions to our cities and such, but that's not enough. We need finer grain of decision-making to solve some of the problems. Not only solving some of the problems to create the kind of lean economy I was talking about. That is to say, we need to really be more productive. That's another uh, aspect I emphasize in the book. That is to say, <clears throat> we tend to work a lot and work for one company, one job. And when we lose that job, we're in trouble. During the COVID and during the uh, 2008, 2009 crisis, we learned that diversifying your daily life and production is very important to survive. You know, a lot of us started secondary businesses, you know, a lot of big offices split into small, big businesses split into small, you know, that happened. And we learned that, you know, there's a way you can do that. And especially with the COVID as well, you know, especially those businesses depending on the social interaction failed a lot. And then people diversified as much as possible very fast. And that is the kind of, you know, that's financial resiliency, that diversification. That is to say, don't depend on one job, do other things on the side. That can be enabled if you have strong relations with your neighbors and you make some of those decisions in the neighborhood. So much so that, you know, we advocate certain building permits can be issued by neighborhood. It doesn't go, need to go to the city hall or, mm -hmm. and run into a big uh, bureaucracy, especially if some of those sustenance systems are local. That is, we have five blocks area, and within that five blocks, we have a solar farm, we have a waste system, et cetera, so forth. So why do I need to go for my building permit to the city? We can decide that. It mm -hmm. used to be that way in the history. You know, those decisions are made much more locally. That's the kind of subsidiarity we need today. Uh, and succession is, agility of those decisions. That is to say, if I'm gonna change my room here and do a cafe there, or I'm gonna put a dentist office there, that decision and renovation should be done very fast. That's, mm -hmm. you know, if we have that kind of agility in changing our physical environments mm -hmm. and make decisions, then that succession, that is to say, increasing relationships that support each other, increasing activities within an environment that support each other. That's to me succession. It's not the amount of business and diversity, it's how these diverse businesses and economic activities support each other, that's succession. 
you go to a very uh, uh, environment, then that's also the strength of the local economy. So that's why that you know it sounds like a joke, you know, two days restaurants, you know, each day. but that's part of the equation. That is to say, if you would be able to, you could be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Not only your life would be more resilient, but also the neighborhood's life, uh, life would be more resilient. Well, it, it sounds like a, uh, a joke or a humorous or kind of a fun element of this neighborhood. But in reality, it was the one that explained to me one of your main points, which I didn't really understand from the perspective of coding, because you emphasize even in your coding appendix, the concepts of sharing, giving, and enjoyment, which sounds promising. It sounds like a good life, but this generally happens spontaneously uh, in a formal sense. Can you code? Can you manage through a code and in, in manage and enforce enjoyment? I mean, how do you codify something like something like that? Well, pursuit of happiness. You know, it's an overarching principle. <laughs> yeah. I mean, hey, of course you cannot enforce it, but uh, I think in terms of the transformation, there are the policy transformations. The certain paradigms need to shift, but also individually the way we look at our lives you know even though pursuit of happiness is written out there this has been a very puritan country and mm -hmm. pleasure enjoyment was not accepted mm -hmm. <laughs> for a long time. I mean, uh, the implication of that is very important because if we're going to have a strong social relations and strong social order in the neighborhood level <clears throat> we need to really shift our attitude as well and that's very important because you know uh, i was just you know this weekend i was in the uh urban thinkers campus and there's that argument you know yeah you're talking about neighbors but i hate my neighbor well <laughs> you're not gonna have the luxury of hating your neighbor if your life depends on your neighbor and mm -hmm. that's what happens when the storm hits a lot mm -hmm. of isolated areas, if they can support each other, they survive. Mm -hmm. So that is very important. That is, we need to shift that. And it happens because of the way suburbia is organized and the way our lives are organized, actually. It's because, you know, mm -hmm. there's no reason we need to be friends with our neighbors. Mm -hmm. We don't need uh, a beer. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, if our water is coming from a water tower we share in a block, then I need to really be good friends with my neighbors, right? <laughs> so anyway. So we got a few questions here from uh, folks listening in. <clears throat> and um, Ryan uh, uh, Stevenson says he, he loves uh, the plan, uh, the planning, the plan design and the program. Uh, but he refers back to your original book, which I actually see as a companion to this book, because in that original book, you really talk about more about the structures, about the uh, uh, forms. And he says in your book, uh, Crafting Form-Based Codes, uh, you reference Max Weber in describing the governance of coding. Um, but another one of your favorites, Marx, was famous for suggesting capitalism was a result of technological disruption. Whereas Weber suggested that capitalism was as, as a result of religion. So what was it about Weber that attracted you to make comparisons to his ideas in the context of coding? Well, Max Weber's way of defining what law is, legal system, and where it's coming from and where it's going to, really embedded in our discipline of jurisprudence, and the way the formal system approaches to law. So I'm not necessarily agreeing with him in the sense that that formal system is the future and formal system needs to be law. I'm using Weber to define that, what that formal system is, what basically uh, technocracy is. Uh, and then I'm actually contrasting that, saying that, you know, to me, what Weber says is that the legal system ideally is a machine. It's mm -hmm. the 
traffic light. And the societies are going that way. What I'm saying is that, no, you look at the zoning, the history of zoning, it's the other way around. We're really going to have traffic officers and making much more dynamic and uh, a system where there's much more communication in it. So that's how I use Weber and that's to contrast and create that scale of formal versus informal mm -hmm. systems. And I mean, in terms of the religion, in terms of the religion, I mean, that's, I really believe and agree with him, the fact that the Protestant ethic started mm -hmm. the And that's why I keep coming back to the Puritan, the, the work ethic and all that stuff that really kind of prevents us to engage pleasurefully with our neighbors and do something together. Guilt free. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Stephanie Bothwell wants to know, how does density work along the transect? Is there a maximum density that allows your concept of self-sufficiency to work? I, I was pointing to the other. Is there a minimum? Is there a maximum? How do people? Well, uh, the transect in the 15 minutes, uh, <clears throat> I mean, the book assigns amount of buildings and amount of structures per uh, per compound. And then the urban transect become I mean, transect becomes much or urban in the uh, town center. Now that's the inner organization of the model of the village. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know transect can be applied in different contexts and differently. I mean, if we're doing an urban infill, it's going to be a completely different kind of a transect there. Mm -hmm. Now density, on the other hand, and what we're saying, eighteen people per acre is a sweet spot. It's not a rule, it's not like, it's just a number, but it's a number where you can provide 5,000 people in 15 minutes walking, and that can be supported with available localization technologies today. That is to say, it's very easy to provide energy for that. It's really easy to provide some kind of water source and such. So that's the sweet spot. Uh, <clears throat> however, what happens is that if you go denser, those technologies start to fail. You know, you need mm -hmm. bigger systems. If you get mm -hmm. less dense, then you're not have enough diversity to create a, a strong local economy. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, in it's not a black and white. If you're in an urban infield situation, you need to get more dense and less self-sufficient. It's still okay. Any self-sufficiency is resilience. Mm -hmm. So whatever you can do in that particular con condition, you should do. I mean, suburbia is going to be tougher, tougher ones. You know, it's like politically and structurally, the spatial organization, etc., so forth. But still. You know, you need to start somewhere and provide, you know, get rid of the vulnerabilities and provide more strength. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a density question. That is to say, the density of 18 people per acre is just a number and it's a reference number. And so it's a, it's a balancing point. If you have less people, it becomes difficult to have the skill set, the all of the uh, the labor and everything you need to be self sufficient. If you have too many, it's just difficult to handle all that much waste, provide that much water, provide enough for that massive number of uh, of, of people. You know, and again, I mean, you say I, I like to emphasize that though. You let's say you're in the middle of an urban environment, high density. Mm -hmm. There's still a level of self-sufficiency you can create in several blocks area within the walking shed. I mean, that's the, it doesn't have to be a village out there. You right. can create that kind of self-sufficiency within the blocks of the big metropolitan city, right? I mean, that the more you do that, the more resilient you're, you're gonna become. 
New York used to be an example of that. It is it is no longer, but it was an example of that, of the local butcher and the and the seamstress and all of those businesses that were within a block of wherever you live. Now, now that's gone. But so and uh and Daigle asks uh and says, Hi Corkett, great job on defining what adaptation relocation looks like. Did you also define the most critical elements of analysis to choose receiver and out-of-bounds legacy places? Were these locations prioritized in some order? I'm thinking specifically of things like soil type, potable water, aquifer access, natural habitats, and existing wetlands, forest, prairie, best ag land slated for protection. In other words, is there a criteria for selecting these relocation areas? Uh, great question. Has been a lot of discussion. You know, Scott Bernstein works on that very question a lot. One thing I'd like to say is that uh, we need to change the way we look at the receiving zone. It's not a receiving city. It's not a re receiving region. It's a re receiving zone that comes with these policies. If we keep that in mind, for instance, a criteria like walkability becomes irrelevant because we're going to create, I mean, if we're really serious about these uh, policies, we're going to create walkability. And that's the purpose anyway. Right? We say mm -hmm. that within walking shed, there needs to be these, et cetera, so forth. So, but <clears throat> in terms of the criteria, other criteria, I think Scott is doing a really good job, and there are others as well. The, my recommendation is really see the receiving zone as a zoning category. And when you do that, all those questions become very mm -hmm context bound that is to say mm -hmm. it really depends where you are if you're in florida you look at the safer receiving zones in a different way than if you're in fire mm -hmm. uh, danger california for instance or colorado right. whatever like that. i mean mm -hmm. but what i'm saying is that every metropolitan area every county should look at their context to create those receiving zones and then mm -hmm. the criteria would come from mapping and you know a lot of good environmental research is out there looking at the all the soil and water and uh, other conditions maybe some new aspects to the phase 1 analysis of a site mm -hmm. the, the environmental analysis not just for environmental hazards and hidden um <clears throat> hidden hazards but rather also opportunities on the site for yeah. for independence because now, uh, let me add to that, that, that is to say, you know, I'm seeing these maps, you know, safer areas colored in one color, et cetera, so forth, for the United States. Mm -hmm. what that, that kind of map is a little bit, there's a danger there. That is to say, if we say, for instance, ABC cities are really safe, mm -hmm. it's almost like the way the, uh, to, you know, Tourism branding works. You know, this is the best way to ski. No, our state is our city is better. And then there's this competition between them. And what mm -hmm. happens? Gentrification. You know, a result of that kind of competition, you really mm -hmm. get certain homogeneous groups, and you mm -hmm. lose that diversity. I mean, you create cities. This is this is happening in ski industries a lot. You know, you create cities where the doctors cannot afford to live there, and the fire mm -hmm. departments. I mean, fire chief is living outside of the city, et cetera, so forth. So that mm -hmm. kind of diversity, you lose that. Yeah, yeah. you're sort of hitting on uh, partial response to Rafik Ibrahim's uh, question, which is, what are the challenges to shift from a land use pattern that's based on functional separation of a single use into a more mixed use, new urbanism approach and what is the role of the market? Well, my answer is start somewhere. <laughs> I mean, it would be great. I mean, let me put it this way. CNU is a perfect organization to lobby for a federal act. New adaptation act. I mm -hmm. mean, there's that level of, but you can't, you don't need to wait, do, I mean, each community can start doing something right now. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> you need to start somewhere. In terms of the, I mean, single use, 
hybrid use, this is the perfect time. We, we learned a lot uh, in COVID. We learned that we can actually produce, run business, make mm -hmm. stuff in our homes. Mm -hmm. And even the most <clears throat> conservative uh, zoning administrator nowadays are open to the idea. So mm -hmm. this is the perfect time to make that shift. Mm -hmm. uh, but really, I mean, that, that has, you know, uh, I'm sure in the audience, there are a lot of professionals working to do exactly mm -hmm. that every day, trying to convince people that, you know, you need to introduce more users, et cetera, and so forth. But uh, yeah, but we never seen that as a necessity or as a tool to create resilience in the face of climate crisis. So that's why mm -hmm. it's becoming much more important for us now. Probably what uh, will help shape the market too is stories like the one that uh, was just in the newspapers a lot for Babcock Ranch, where the where the little uh, suburb was able to survive the impact of the storm simply by having not all, but some elements of uh, of self sufficiency. So that may uh, that may also promote a market acceptance, even a market appetite for an adaptation community that has these elements, because. Man, uh, floods and storms and fires can be pretty scary uh, from the pr from a market perspective. <laughs> if I knew my community was flood proof and had uh, all of these uh, elements within it that I could uh, handle these kinds of events, I'd live much more comfortable than I do. So yeah, the market, I think, will, will the role of the market will be people want safety. They want that kind of independence that adaptation uh, permits. Now, uh, Megan uh, Tenhoff has a question, and if you are able to answer it, maybe you can elucidate, elucidate a little bit on, on um, whom she's referring to. She asks, are you familiar with Linda Shi at Cornell? And if so, can you dis discuss how your work intersects? So if you can answer that question, also let us know who Linda Shi is at Cornell and how it relates. The name is very familiar. Uh... Is she the one who researches the reason why people are moving and where mo people are moving where? I don't know. Uh, if that is the say, uh, case, I mean, that's a great answer to the market question. That is to say, it's already happening. <laughs> people are already asking those questions and moving to the places where, you know, uh, mm -hmm. more resilient lifestyles are offered. On the uh, in terms of scale, there's a couple of questions uh, regarding scale. The compound seems scaled to operate at a three to four story maximum form. Uh, <laughs> does this affect the density, but can still accomplish complete places that depend on enough people living and working in the same place? And this question is uh, from um, Patrick from Patty. Yeah, hi, Patty. Uh, like I said, what we did is just one model and the number 18 people per acre produces that kind of physical environment. Again, it's not the only way to use the model and the principles of localization. If you're in an urban environment, probably it's gonna be a completely different kind of a physical environment. Nevertheless, the reason why we looked at this particular scale and model is that, <laughs> you know, majority of built environment in this country is in that scale, actually. <laughs> you know? uh, and when you go into the, uh, you know, um, retrofit, maybe there are ways to, I mean, suburbia retrofit, uh, introduce some of these items. And actually, like I showed some of the lot types, we already passed in some communities in Colorado as a zoning, there we're using the regular house, you know, 50 by 120, 50 by 140 sizes. Those are very common in a lot of cities. And within those, you can create compounds. We kind of showed that. And depending on if you're in a, let's say, commercial corridor of a city, there are a lot of them in Denver and a lot of other front, uh, front edge communities. You can really create hybrid use 
compound, you know, a little bit residential, a little bit production, a little bit retail, it's, it's possible. And there was a question, you know, where do we start? We start with that as well, you know, <laughs> start changing the zoning ordinances. So how would a building permit uh, be issued at a neighborhood block scale? If cities have staff capacity, competency issues, wouldn't that be exacerbated at even smaller scales? Uh, centralized systems have the ability to become more efficient. Most of the time they aren't though. And uh, what, what uh, but they have the ability to be, whereas smaller systems would seem to lack the inherent ability to efficiently manage the level of development review and that society has grown accustomed to. It seems that we need a lean building permitting process to make smaller scale review work efficiently. This is Eric um, Pate. And I think the overall question is, how would a building permit be issued at a neighborhood block scale? Yeah. Uh... We need to imagine the structure of that particular neighborhood. We're talking about a lot of localized systems nesting with each other. Those localized systems are businesses as well as technologies. First, we start with that. That is to say, you know, this is, there needs to be some transformation parallel to what we are saying. And then, you know, even Boulder, I live in Longmont, it's uh, you know, 120,000. Let's say here, even here, the building department's overloaded. They cannot, you know, they cannot really respond well. What we're saying is that don't take all the load out of them. It's like certain buildings, certain, you know, I go into a little bit more detail of that in the book is that certain renovations, certain uh, level of construction can be done without going to the city. Now, uh, in the book, I go to, in, in the, uh, there are two appendices. Uh, the second one goes through some concepts. And in the nesting, I say that nesting enables the small. And I'll just read this. Largeness may, A, lead to excessive standardization and bureaucratization. B, reduce social consciousness and the sense of personal civic responsibility, and thus C, weaken democratic process. Even though we have really strong local democracies in our cities, I'm seeing exactly this is happening. People are so frustrated with the city and what's going on in their neighborhoods and lack of control that they feel completely hostile and there is no you know, I have to say, productive democratic debate. I think I Rob showed up. up. We're coming on Rob to showed up. the hour. <laughs> um, we'll be, uh, we're at 12.59, it'll be one o'clock. Uh, and uh, uh, some people will probably be leaving at that point. And, uh, um, but we can continue talking if there are more questions, as long as there are uh, and you want to uh, continue to answer them. Um, and those who uh, have to sign off at one o'clock can watch the video uh, when it is posted uh, mm -hmm. uh, tomorrow. Um, so if you want to continue on, Fernando, for if there are more questions. Yes, there's a few more questions. And uh, if Cork is game, I'm game. Sure. I'm enjoying this, so it's part of my enjoyment uh, <laughs> of this virtual community. Um, now, Rick Cole asks, um, I assume this is uh, famous Rick Cole, uh, your model shows tangibly how to adapt uh, by building a new, new neighborhoods. To what extent do you see the potential to adapt existing built form, including retrofit of sprawl? That's a good question. Uh, again, if I had a lot of time and did good projects in uh, retrofit, we would be able to show the examples, but it's going to be challenging, uh, especially in urban infill and suburban retrofit. But, you know, we are having some discussions, even in a Mac mansion, there are ways if you change the law to include not only other, I mean, to include 
productive activities, businesses and production, but also ways to really remodel houses to mm-hmm. rent and which is already happening, by the way. I mean, by necessity, people doing that. Mm-hmm. So that gives me kind of a hope that is to say, maybe it's case by case, you know, you cannot just have a, uh, I mean, let me put it this way. I see this model as like TOD, transfer oriented development model. The principles are here, but each TOD is different from each other. And then mm-hmm. the way it fits is different. And this is the same kind of thing. You know, the aim is localization of the sustenance systems and creating a locally supportive social order that can manage that following the subsidiarity system uh, principle. So how can you do that in suburbia? Hopefully we'll see some examples soon, uh, more comprehensively, but I have a faith that, you know, with the design creativity and uh, understanding of the principles, there are ways to make those places much more resilient. Sure. One informal example, um, another member of uh, CNU, James Rojas, uh, talks about the um, East LA, Los Angeles neighborhoods, that suburban neighborhoods where the McMansions have been transformed by the Hispanic population into multifamily. Multifamily, by that I mean, mean several families, but rather many members of one family living under one roof. And it's to such an extent that the building departments have thrown up their hands and just let it let it happen because it's too many. I assume there'll be some of that, that simply it'll change out of necessity. And the the obstacle, the bureaucratic obstacles, will sort of give way like a like a dam that breaks under the force of the yeah. The I current. mean, that, that's a great example. And in those kind of cases, it's not like anything goes. Uh, a block or a neighborhood can create their own controls. I mean, certain things are okay, certain mm-hmm. things are not okay. Up to them. That's subsidiarity. That is to say. It's up to them to decide that because not everything should go to the city hall. That's the kind of thing. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of regular regulation culture would fit this kind of subsidiarity. Well, Kim Dietz kind of follows up on the same question as Rick Cole, except she adds the uh, the element of land prices into it. And the fact that land costs are going up and up, driving higher densities in the sense of, you know, apartment buildings and such to be able to accommodate uh, uh, incomes uh, relative to the to the cost of obtaining a reasonable rent or reasonable mortgage. And the elimination of uh, open spaces, you know, how do you generate things like compounds where you have courtyards and natural areas and, and agriculture and all that when the land values are so high that uh, so there's kind of a again a market issue there. How do, how do you how do you get that to work? Well, I assume I mean, you I, I assume you don't have all the answers. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, location, 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 right? Mm-hmm. That's the real estate it depends on where you are. When you look at any given metropolitan area, still we see majority is suburban, mm-hmm. and the cheapest square foot per I mean the uh, price per square foot is still in suburbia and that creates a lot of you know uh, social equity issues because you know the lowest income families spend most of their income in percentage to transportation which is not right I mean uh, that's why to me suburban retrofit in those kind of areas in the fringes in terms of market, it's going to be easier. Now, density, that's why, I mean, you go to the urban areas, the density goes up, you have those, you know, five-story, four-story apartment buildings, and because of the land and the construction, (laughs) more complex buildings, uh, the prices go up. And again, even in that, the idea of tax deductible rent is going to change mm-hmm. that a little bit. Mm-hmm. It's yes. already happening. For the first time, we're seeing the middle class is not able to get loans for house mm-hmm. or even car mm-hmm. nowadays. I mean, it's getting really there. And then we see a big increase in rental market now. Mm-hmm. 
again, it's a great time to really change that and say, you know, mm. make this such that it's not only by necessity people need to rent, but it's a financially good option to rent and get some mm. uh, rent deduction and invest in another endeavor that can produce mm. for you. So, sure. but again, you know, it really depends on where you are in the metropolitan area. Yes. I mean, let me put it this way. If you look at receiving cities in terms of the amenities we urbanites love, you know, the services, walkability and such, yes, you're going to end up with most expensive receiving areas. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm saying don't use those criteria for receiving it. Use environmental criteria and mm -hmm. create those amenities in the new location uh -huh. or in suburban retrofit. Create it there. Mm -hmm. And if you do a lot, then the market is going to settle to that. Now, Michael Ziarnik has a... Um... A question that's related in the sense that uh, he's he's addressing and he's asking you to speak to the vast amounts of non-productive agriculture. By that, I think he means the monoculture of agriculture, Nebraska, huge fields of corn and huge fields of soybeans, period. Unless you can live on feed corn and soybeans, even though you're in an agricultural place, you may be it might be tough to feed your family. So how can we transition to orchards and productive crops with smaller plots? And I think this speaks to the question of the market too, because relatively speaking, that agricultural land is inexpensive land. And maybe a lot of that transformation occurs in places like Nebraska and Iowa with huge amounts of land for receiver communities. Well, there is, you know, monoculture, agriculture in this country cannot survive without a subsidy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a failed economic model. It creates environmental problems, soil gets depleted. We don't create nutrition. You know, I need to eat three apples to get the same nutrition my grandma used to get from one apple. I mean, we created that. Mm -hmm. So how do we transition? There are a couple of things I can say. One is there are really strong movements happening already, transition, you know, the slow food and uh, urban agriculture and, you know, et cetera. But also my second answer is that we have to, otherwise we're doomed. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we don't have the luxury anymore, you know. Yeah. What happened in the COVID, we couldn't get certain food items. I mean, if it gets right. worse, we're we're not gonna find food. That's that simple. Uh, unless yeah. we produce in the vicinity, in our backyards or in the neighborhoods, right? Yes. Survival is a strong market force. Hunger yeah. is a strong market force. So, I mean, there's a really yeah. interesting uh, example. Uh, what's his name? Bob. The, the transition book talks about what happened during the Second World War in England. Mm -hmm. Realize, a, yeah, exactly. There's a, uh, you know, a food shortage, and they really mm -hmm. supported backyard food growing. And in a few years, they reduced their food dependency 50%. Wow. So if you put your energy and, you know, national policy support to that particular aspect, the tran transformation is pretty fast, actually. Mm -hmm. But... There's so much investment in monoculture now. It's it's like oil, you know. How are you going to stop that money? <laughs> so, but again, you need to start somewhere. Yeah, and some of it may happen on its own. Now, many of the examples that you cite are actually things that are working currently in poorer countries in the third world. I'm thinking of my experience uh, living in Ecuador for several years, and the tax deductions were for you had a tax deduction for your living expenses in the sense of your rent or mortgage, whatever it was. You had a tax deduction for your medical expenses, your food and your clothing, the four essentials. Shelter, food, clothing, medicine, three tax deductions, that's it. Whatever you spent on that came right off your taxes. And then, uh, well, if you had excess, you paid on that excess. 
So there, there are examples right now in the world that uh, would be easy to look at. Now, as a final question, I've been, it happens to be the last question, I think. Yes, it is. It's Nancy uh, Bruning, and it's also kind of a good wrap-up question. What's been the greatest resistance to this type of thinking? What are people afraid of? What are the things that people resist? What's blocking this idea? Oh, boy. The book just came out. I don't know. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> uh, but, I mean, I would assume... I would assume a lot of things, actually. You know, there's the... Uh, When you create that much of uh, isolation and single-use neighborhoods, you're maximizing car use and oil use, gas use. And it has been this country's history that that really determined and lobbied and affected a lot of decisions. It's really a big force you can it's not easy to fight against but then again scale matters you know if you start somewhere it's going to go somewhere so i don't know that's that's one thing i see and there's also in front of us an emergency i mean it's like you know the storms are happening fires are happening floods are happening we need to really make our lives much more resilient very fast so when do you break ground on the first adaptation village and where can I sign up for, for my for a lot? <laughs> well, let's hope so. Let's hope Thank you. Happen. Thank you. Kurt Thank you, Fernando. Uh, it's been a really interesting discussion, and uh, uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you for this forum. Thank you, Corkett, for writing a wonderful book. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you.